welcome you all to the concluding day of KEDL 2019. I am Saloni, project assistant from Terry. The first theme of the day is digital preservation and cultural heritage. This session will host keynotes involving digital reconstruction techniques, immersive visualization, visual analytics, virtual tours, and others. I request Dr. Ramesh Sigor to be on the dais. Professor Ramesh Sigor is presently Dean, Professor and Head of the Divisions at Indra Gandhi National Center for the Arts, New Delhi, Ministry of Culture, Government of India. During the period October 2011 to January 2018, he was the University Librarian of Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Professor Gore is the first Indian nominated as member, International Advisory Committee, UNESCO Memory of the World Program. He is also member of Expert Consultation Committee for setting up of International Center on Documentary Heritage in South Korea. He is the member of many other important national and international professional bodies. I would request you to take over the session. Good morning, everyone. And let me welcome you to this first session of day three on digital preservation of cultural heritage. Thank you, uh, Professor Das and team KDL for giving me this opportunity to chair this session. The, the topic is very close to my heart and it's my area of activity since uh, almost a decade. And uh, it is not just a session to chair, but also I would be keen, uh, keenly looking forward to the ideas and uh, suggestions regarding this particular topic. We have very eminent panel in this session. So we are starting about 15, 20 minutes late. So we have to see the time constraints. So I will not uh, have any introduction or anything in the begin, uh, beginning of the session. Will you see the in the end, if you have time, we'll have some of my views on the topic. But right now, I, I would like to start straightforward by introducing uh, the first speaker of today's session, Professor Sarah Kenderdine. Uh, she is a, a well-known expert in the field of museum, libraries, and archives, a person who is a pioneer and expert in digital heritage, digital museology, digital humanities and data visualization. And uh, she has, to her credit, uh, excellent publication, more, more than 80 exhibitions. And uh, she was appointed professor of digital museology at the Ecole Polytechnic uh, Federal D. Uh, in Switzerland, where she has built a new laboratory for experimental museology. So with the, such a wide experience, uh, innovative ideas, Let's welcome and give a round of applause to Sarah to make her presentation. Welcome, Sarah. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Gao. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be in India. I've, uh, it's a black slide, it's okay. <laughs> um, I've been involved in many wonderful uh, collaborations here in the past, and I'm also currently engaged in a project which has India as its genesis. For this honor to address you, I'd like to profoundly thank the patrons, advisory committee, general chairs, program committee, and the local organizers. It's been a very energetic cast of people who really deserve an ovation for bringing this fabulous event to fruition. More than 120 years ago in 1889, the curator at the Smithsonian Institute, G.B. Good, delivered a lecture entitled The Future of the Museum, in which he said the future museum would stand side by side with the library and the laboratory. Convergence and collecting organizations propelled by the liquidity of digital data now sees them reconciled as information providers in a networked world. Media theorists have described this world order as database logic, whereby users transform physical assets of cultural organizations into digital assets, 
to be uploaded, downloaded, visualized, shared. Users who treat institutions not as storehouses of physical objects, but rather as data sets to be manipulated. This lecture explores how such mechanistic descriptions can be replaced by ways in which computation becomes experiential, spatial, and materialized, embedded and embodied through various participatory and interactive and immersive regimes for galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. As Marc Foucault set out in the Archaeology of Knowledge in 1969, Archive 1.0 is a product of bureaucracy designed to be used as an instrument of management and power. Following Archive Fever after Jacques Derrida in 1996, Archive 2.0 employs efficient dendritic classification and retrieval. We now enter a period of Archive 3.0 based on the properties of recollection, regeneration, and reworking. This archive is dynamic, corresponding to a move from classification to remix, a paradigmatic shift from the orthodox models of stewardship to one of co-production, as is evident in the development of crowdsourcing applications and APIs. Archive 3.0 also calls for the production and creation of new prosthetic architectures um, for the sharing of archival resources. My research sits at a convergence of aesthetic practice and cultural big data, uh, emerging from 20 years of research and designing interactive frameworks for public engagement with cultural heritage. This work was initially located at Museum uh, Victoria in Melbourne, Australia, where I started to build large-scale systems and experiences for a mass public. I then started to collaborate with universities um, to sustain this architecture um, that we were building. Firstly, at the iCinema Research Center in Sydney. I then moved to Hong Kong and at the Hong Kong Science Park in a thousand square meter laboratory, um, the Applied Laboratory for Interactive Visualization and Embodiment. We built uh, eight large scale systems there and the content. They were then returned to Australia to create the Expanded Perception and Interaction Centre, Epicentre, at the University of New South Wales. Um, and just to give you an idea of what you're looking at on the right-hand side image is a small panoramic system. Um, it's seven metres diameter, comprised of 56 projectors and a 29 computer cluster at 120 million pixels in 3D. It's three times higher resolution than anything else currently in the world. At the edge of human visual acuity, the panorama and the dome that you see were created to solve visualization problems for complexity and big data in the humanities and the sciences. I became heavily involved in scientific visualization. This is a phenome network visualization together with Imperial College in London single molecule science, single cell microscopy, um, co collapsing 53 parameters into a 3D uh, navigable space. And here, sequences for a molecular dome visualization of the proteins found in your blood and the common cold, the rhinovirus magnified one billion times. Enthusiastic to get back to cultural heritage, I accepted the invitation to create a new laboratory in Switzerland, which became uh, the Experimental Museology Lab. I have 1,500 square meters, uh, and again, um, created nine large-scale systems, and there are more in development. These systems offer us strategies for multi-sensory engagement, emphasizing human-to-human -human as well as human-to-machine interaction, and give us powerful ways to reformulate narrative in a digital context. My lab harnesses technologies which have unprecedented abilities to capture the world around us. Laser scanning, for example, collects billions of points to represent places such as these heads at Mount Rushmore, scanned by the Scottish Ten. We can create precious objects in 3D and peer inside to see what was previously unseen. 
We can capture art in a way that allows us to zoom into the tiniest brushstroke and see more than the naked eye can see. Advances in machine learning are also increasingly important to our work and using deep physically based rendering, we recently installed a photogrammetric model of Nefertari's tomb, uh, which was collected in just eight hours of photogrammetry and transformed into billions of points in a real time model. So it uses Unreal Engine, um, it's synchronized across N display on an 11 PC graphics cluster at a resolution of 40 million pixels in 3D, 360 degrees. And we're also capturing intangible heritage through various forms of motion over time analytics. I'm not sure why that video doesn't play. Oh, there we go. Um, so the work in intangible heritage is um, uh, an area in which I'm very active at the moment. So my talk is focused on different strategies for creating and translating these digital records into narratives of engagement by which visitors virtually re-embody and perform the archive. I'll describe this through five themes illustrated by a series of installations and exhibitions embodying cultural imaginaries. I thought no better way to start than one of our Indian collaborations. The dome of the Prince of Wales Museum was adopted as the epicenter of an artistic exploration specifically focused on the ceiling architecture of Mumbai's heritage and contemporary buildings <clears throat> and transforms them into an urban celestial imaginary. 160 gigapixels shot throughout the city and many of you will know Mumbai's architectural heritage is really unrivaled. The city has one of the largest representations of grand neo-Gothic style architecture, numerous examples of Indo-Saracenic architecture, and one of the world's largest concentrations of Art Deco buildings. Uh, this is the Baujilad Museum, um, but there's also Terminal 2 at the new Mumbai airport. So we staged this in the dome. We bought the dome from Australia and uh, located it under the 60-foot dome of the museum, um, a six-meter full dome. And this allowed 2,000 people a day to come and rediscover their city with fresh eyes. It was open to all and gave new perspectives on many of the spaces across Mumbai which are socially exclusive despite the fact of their public heritage status. The work uses a computer vision algorithm which randomly selects any pair of images and creates a unique transition between them. So in effect, you could lie there all day and never see the same thing twice. The perceived uh, hemispheric curvature of domes have been rendered architecturally by many cultures throughout the world and used to enfold the most sacred environments, from Buddhist stupas and Jain temples to Islamic mosques and Christian cathedrals. Dome constructions are places of ritual, communion, and transcendence. The concept of an experiential domed environment emerged from attempts to simulate a spherical gestalt in the human visual field and were designed to exploit and extend sensory perceptions. In collaboration with the National Museum of Australia, we created two dome experiences traveling Kankarangalpa, the <coughs> songline of the Seven Sisters. <clears throat> the songline portrays one of the most defining and predominant meta-narratives chronicled in ancient mainland Australia, but never told in the public domain until this exhibition. A traumatic history of colonial contact made its custodians very wary of disclosing details of their sacred knowledge and yet this songline was in jeopardy in the community. The project was seven years in the making from the day that the Anugu elders came to the museum and asked for help to uh, ensure the preservation of their broken songline. This digital dome was used for this project to simultaneously express the sphere of the world around us the sky above and the ground below, enveloping viewers in depictions of the Seven Sisters as they travel through country, avoiding the unwanted attentions of a lustful Wadi Nehru. 
As these creation, being travel, uh, creation beings travel the landscape, they leave land formations in their wake. One of these is Cave Hill, and also the constellations of Orion and Pallades in the southern night sky. Um, the first work involved photogrammetry of a sacred cave that had never, ever been photographed before. Time-lapse photography, drone-based panoramas and gigapixel imaging, as well as ambisonics, allowing visitors intimate views of the stories contained in its sandstone folds. So the second of these shows immerses visitors in a series of projected artworks of the song lines made by the custodians of the story and used to tell the story of the Seven Sisters as they travel country. Um, in the final scene, these massive jumpy figures, these trust grass figures are seen taken flight, reconfiguring their to their final destination in the night sky. We made, um, they were collected by the National Museum. Um, we created photogrammetric models. The Aboriginal ladies created um, uh, full dome paintings. Um, depicting the narratives of the song line, which they also interpreted for our team. And uh, then uh, the second um, of these uh, shows is um, based on artwork. So this is a shot from the opening of the exhibition. It won a whole series of awards and it was really quite a seminal um, uh, moment for Aboriginal culture and the National Museum um, to have worked together on this lengthy um, project, a, a watershed in curatorial relations in Australia. Proliferating auras. So traditionally museums are ordering machines, generating conventions of looking, institutionalized, with qualities of mechanized reason, similitude, homeostasis, and miniaturization. While digital uh, installations may be at the threshold of new ways of seeing, such work continues to occupy an uneasy space in museums where their artful materialities of an intangible, reproducible, and transmittable pose a threat to institutionalized claims of uniqueness and authenticity. They challenge conventions of interpretation. Recent debates, however, have clearly indicated how digital copies, in fact, any type of replica or rendering, form part of the trajectory of the originating object's cultural career. The conservator Adam Lowy recently described for the New Yorker last year how a digital copy, a recorded copy, can be both a load of forensically accurate information, but also a vehicle for provoking deep emotional response. So against this backdrop, um, I'm going to explore issues related to post-digital authenticity and aura through the Dunhuang Caves at the Gobi Desert in northernmost China. At the nexus of the Silk Road, this World Heritage Site has 492 caves carved into this cliff face. Inside, 45,000 square meters of painted frescoes and over 2,000 stucco statues crafted by Buddhist monks over a period of a 1,000 years. This sublime art treasury is like nothing else in the Chinese Buddhist world. The library cave, cave 17, 15 cubic meters of manuscripts and paintings, most of which were removed by explorer archaeologists. The significance of this site is underscored by what was contained here, including the oldest book in the world, the Diamond Sutra, and the earliest known depiction of the Chinese constellations. These caves are under serious threat from increasing tourism. An enormous preservation effort is underway. Mass digitization is being done by over 60 full-time photographers, and it takes three months to digitize a single cave. We took the wireframe from and the texture data from uh, Cave 220 to create pure land inside the Magal Grottoes at Dung Wan. It's staged in a 360 3D environment. This is 10 meters diameter and four and a half meters high, and it allows about 30 people a one-to-one -one scale experience of being inside the cave. So there's lots of audio through this presentation. Can any of you hear that from the computer? It's okay. Um, uh, 
uh, we simulate what it's like to be there now. Um, if you go to Dongwan, you're with uh, about 60 people and a few LED torches, but of course a digital cave is um, completely navigable. I'm not going to go through this whole project, but just to say that this work has been seen in a physical sense by over a million people now. We um, were able to create five different works out of a single data set, and it's an important uh, idea that uh, data is so malleable that you can create very different works out of exactly the same content. So for this one, we printed the wireframe on the walls of an exhibition booth that was originally done for Art Basel in, in Hong Kong and then toured around the world. It's done at one-to-one -one scale and visitors are walking inside the digital model. It's like a window on the world, if you like. An interface like this um, has a number of noteworthy properties for museums. The, the first is the way in which it harnesses socialization around um, a single interface. So socialization being at the core of the museum experience, it's not about giving everybody their own device, it's really about how you give a scaffold to social experiences. Interfaces also need to be for young kids, middle-aged ladies, um, grandmother and grandchild. Grandmother abandons the grandchild and takes off at the screen, so these non-ageist uh, interfaces. Um, and the third noteworthy trope is this one uh, where the wife has taken an iPad from her handbag and she's filming her husband's experience as if they were really there virtual, virtual tourism. So these the work like this is typically installed in um, a fine art context, um, but it may also, um, uh, such as this is at the a Big Tang um, show at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, um, but it also may end up in a media art context or even an art context, um, depending on how people perceive it. Um, uh, an, another work out of exactly the same data for a full dome for the World Economic Forum. Uh, and here, the pyramidal cave, it's a pyramidal cave, and the architectonic relationship between the model and the full dome was perfect. And so we did um, live tours under the dome for the WEF delegates, myself and an imminent Chinese monk. Um, navigating and using all the tools that we um, developed for that work. So, as we know, uh, moving image and sound archives are the major records of the 20th and 21st century. Beyond issues of digitization, the sheer size and temporal nature of audiovisual archives presents its custodians with significant challenges related to access. Copyright restrictions further complicate this and much of our most important material can only be shown in the institutional setting that the custodians um, of this material have, and it cannot be distributed on the internet. So we build a whole range of works based on um, moving image archives. So just to show you um, some of these, uh, this is an early one, T-Visionarium. It takes 24 hours of free-to-air broadcast TV footage, takes it offline, analyzes it by software. Every cam time there's a camera angle change, there's a cut made in the movie. We end up with a database of 24,000 clips. We then hire four guys, they sit in a room and they hand tag these four second clips um, with very idiosyncratic metadata. So there's no machine learning tool that will do this for you yet. Um, emotion, expression, um, physicality, very subjective tagging, um, and then more obvious ones such as gender and color and so on. We then stream uh, 500 simultaneous streams of video um, to uh, the 360 3D system. His deadlines more discerns and more discerns. And then you can operate on the database. Um, so when you click on any image, it goes into the data set and it brings everything that's semantically most similar to one side, everything that's most dissimilar is behind you. You can um, then 
this is 11 years old, by the way, this work, so things look a bit kind of hokey, but um, you can collect, uh, can, um, wait your searching. He will just um, click on color because it's the most obvious for this demonstration. Um, he'll click on the fiery red stuff. This one's based on luminosity of the image. It brings all the fiery red stuff to one side and it brings all the black and white or low luminosity images um, behind you. Uh, and also you can add clips together. So in the, the vein of mashup culture, you can create your own movie out of um, various clips of TV data. We know at most major museums there's only a fraction of collection on display. And at the Smithsonian, it's 2%. British Museum, it's 0.4%. At Museum Victoria, it's 0.8%. So in this one, there's 100,000 objects. It's an export from the content management system. Museum owns a 360 system. So the content was, um, how should we say, ingested um, or exported rather within 15 minutes. So um, once you have a good data set, you can do almost anything with it. It creates a wordle from the description. You can zoom into the images. There are 18 themes that goes across natural sciences, social history, and indigenous material. And probably what's most important is it makes metadata relationships um, for uh, moving through this, um, these different themes. It's a kind of serendipitous browsing um, paradigm, uh, and it, it has no particular search engine. This is a work um, for an exhibition I just built called Infinity Room 2, uh, which uses a database, interactive database. So um, the dome becomes a hemispheric gestalt for jazz luminaries, and it's based on social network constellations of jazz greats from the Montreal Jazz Archive, which is in total 11,000 hours of video. Uh, and this installation cuts, remixes, and replays 5,400 artists and 13,000 videos. Um, it uses a spherical ball interface, physically emulating the hemispheric image plane. And it plays with this idea of replacing text search um, by auditory strategies of tuning, um, like radio surfing. Um, so it's uh, search by listening. So imagine you are lying under the dome. Your spherical ball is moving. What's on the screen? This was all the songs that was paid in these years, and then you can move through to the entire song. It's a six meter dome, so it's quite spectacular. Um, also, again, these systems that have single um, interfaces also are highly social and the interface is shared. Um, so EPFL have, um, it's a memory of the world archive um, registered by the memory of the world and it's used for a range of research projects and including this one which was um, encoding two songs, uh, Miles Davis's Tutu um, and Smoke Over the Water by Deep Purple um, and these were encoded um, into DNA sequences so it means the entire Montreux Jazz archive is, um, is encapsulated in a grain of sand. It means the entire data of the world could be stored in a single suitcase. So this is radically repositioning the transmission of objects through time and space. So you can de-encode these sequences and listen to two of these songs, these two songs, um, in, in the galleries at EPFL. So I'm working um, a lot on embodied knowledge systems. I'll make this quick. Um, this is South Chinese Kung Fu um, masters um, that all fled from mainland China um, in, at high risk of, um, of uh, becoming completely lost. 
Um, there are 33 elite masters and we're documenting them and their practices in a myriad of ways. Lots of motion capture. Um, we've captured 53% of the repertoire. It's been going since 2012. Um, and uh, you can see here, this is Oscar. Both his father and grandfather were um, Kung Fu masters. And um, we have motion over time analytics of, of that material. And that then becomes um, a series of exhibitions. We've had eight exhibitions worldwide um, of, based on these archival materials that we've been creating. Um, most of them are large-scale interactive exhibitions where you're looking at Kung Fu Master at one-to-one -one scale and this system you're walking around and looking inside. It's annotated, um, it's in 3D, it's interactive, um, a whole series of different um, analytics and procedural modeling graphics. This is speed at any mo point on the body, at any point in time, a typical particle simulation. And then it becomes highly aestheticized um, in these kinds of um, motion graphics. This is Lam Sai Wing. We made a 3D model of him. He's the first, fight choreog uh, first Kung Fu master um, to end fight choreographer for cinema. Um, to use photography in studio practice. And we have books of hand drawings of him. So we create a 3D model of him and we apply the motion capture sequence of his great-great-grand-nephew. Um, so it's quite a strange archival object. It's a chi building um, uh, taolu, uh, this particular piece. This stands at life size in the galleries. Um, pose matching. So, uh, a great crowd pleaser. Um, this is 5, 000, uh, 500 to 1,000 frame a second video because they're all moving so fast. This is Yao Wenhua, he's in his 80s. We've done all of the weapons, um, the weapons training that they do, very crude in implements that they use. Um, we capture all of the ritual culture also that um, is associated with this particular Kung Fu. This was Hong Kong in the 70s. This is it today. So there are no Chinese people learning Kung Fu. There's Master Lam in the middle with his group from Czechoslovakia. So Americans, Europeans and Australians are all flocking to Hong Kong, but there's no local people learning. The Hong Kong government will now build a museum and establish a research center for this community, um, basically through the efforts of, or th through this archive and their commitment to this project. Um, I'm going to skip over this one so I can finish on something that's current. Oh, this is current, actually, it's ongoing. So this is Confucian ritual reenactment. Um, it's a collaboration with Tsinghua University where we're looking at a 5th century BC manuscript and um, reconstructing 17 rituals. We've only done three so far. Um, and it's to create um, interactive resources for studying and appreciating um, gesture and meaning in, in Confucian rituals and the understanding of the Chinese modern body. Um, it finds itself around the world uh, in various settings from contemporary art to classic art museums. This is the Art Institute Chicago where these videos um, augment a classic object exhibition. Um, just to give you an insight into the scale of this kind of undertaking. Um, so it's Beijing Opera, um, Professor Pang and his team uh, research all the architecture and they recreate all the costumes and uh, train the, the opera performers and then we shoot them in a myriad of ways in massive sort of green screen, pseudo green screen type environments and then we extract um, all the video materials out um, and rebuild everything in computer graphics. So in this particular scene which is just a demo everything that you're looking at apart from the guys walking through the door is computer graphics. 
Um, and so just to finish, um, this is a, a work that I'm uh, completing at the moment, and it's the Atlas of Maritime Buddhism, and it's based on the compelling story of the spread of Buddhism from India through the seaports of Southeast Asia and the South China Sea, supported by archaeological and historical evidence that's never been um, brought together before. So the research and exhibition series is um, of profound contemporary relevance to the socio-economic and political transformations of the world by the Chinese government-led initiative known as the One Belt, One Road. While this far-reaching enterprise reactivates ancient overland and maritime trading routes, the Atlas counterbalances prevailing narratives that which neglect the importance of pan-Asian maritime countries and Buddha's entrepreneurship in the expansion of trade from the second century BC through to the 14th century AD. The spread of Buddhist doctrines from India to China triggered a profusion of cross-cultural exchange that had a profound impact on Asian and world history. It was a complex process and that involved multiple societies and diverse groups of people, including missionaries, itinerant traders, artisans, and medical professionals. While textiles made up a percentage of trade between the Mediterranean and Asia, spice, and in particular black pepper, found in the forests of South India was a major part of the commerce. So we could say the maritime silk route might be better described as a spice route. Buddhism was spread by sailors who took with them their votus talisman, intrepid monks from China and present-day Indonesia played a key role in the exchanges between ancient India and China. Monks introduced new texts and doctrines to the Chinese clergy, carried and distributed Buddhist paraphernalia for the performance of rituals and ceremonies, and provided detailed accounts of their spiritual journeys to India. These included monks such as Yi Jing, uh, Ji Ying, uh, who in the 7th century uh, AD traversed China to India via the maritime routes in a journey that took 25 years. He brought back some 400 translated Buddhist texts and extensive travel diaries which describe his journey to Nalanda in northern India, Sri Javaya in, in Indonesia and Kedai in Malaysia. He translated more than 60 sutras from Sanskrit into Chinese, and it's clear from the meticulous documentary records of these monks that India was held in huge esteem by the Chinese of this period. So the atlas starts in the rock-cut caves of India. It's pan-Asian, spatially and temporally enabled resources are very diverse. Um, and I'll just skip through this. The story is to complete the so-called great circle of Buddhism, which has not been told in the public domain. So um, we've been imaging hundreds of sites across 12 countries, actually thousands of uh, locations, um, in ultra-high um, gigapixel imaging, stereographic panoramas, and so on. Um, the fieldwork trips are very modest. We have a range of really easy going gear, but we're able out of this gear to create um, extremely high resolution 3D panoramic and, and spherical materials. Um, ambisonics, of course, for sound field recordings. Um, Schwagadam Pagoda, um, the most revered sites in Burma, which is a fusion of historical and the mythological. Um, Shikestra in um, uh, the Pew Kingdom in the Irrawaddy. Um, and this is the first time uh, where Buddhism really got a permanent foothold in Southeast Asia was here um, and embraced all classes of society from the ruling elite to the agrarian laborers. Um, this is gigapixel imaging in Mandalay. Um, the stupa at Sanati. Um, containing elaborate um, sculptured panels depicting King Ashoka. Um, of course, the great universities of Buddhist scholarship such as Nalanda and Bihar. The stupa at Sanshi. Um, and Nuradapura in uh, Sri Lanka, the largest brick stupa in the world. As you can see, it's wonderful. Um, and this is monsoon or Ayutthaya. So this monumental fieldwork trip is um, drawing to a close. 
um, in the coming months. We're just about to shoot China and uh, then Korea and Japan. And uh, it's not easy to show a work which isn't built, but the idea is that you're out at sea in this big virtual world um, and you then go uh, to a, um, one of these countries. It's wracked with Kato criticism theory, um, which I won't go into right now, but then you enter into each one of these country layers associated with textiles from this country. You're able to navigate inside these 3D panoramas and this is not um, from the atlas, this is humpy, so don't be confused. Um, and then these panoramas are augmented with a range of heterogeneous data coming from the overall archive, um, which is so enormous. Uh, also, photogrammetry has become a vital component of this data capture process. Here, Jayavarman VII from Angkor at the National um, Museum of Cambodia. And alongside um, the, the field work, um, ambisonic recordings, we're doing a lot of ethnographic musicology, um, which augment these, um, these materials. Sorry. This is um, this Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara from the National Museum of Colombo, um, of Sri Lanka in Colombo. So as the fortunes, livelihoods, and lives of the sailors were beholden to the vicissitudes of the oceans, they sought supernatural assistance to aid them in their endeavors. The worship of Avalokiteshvara incorporate beliefs that he could offer salvation from the ravages of the sea. By the time Avalokiteshvara meets uh, uh, China, it has really transformed and become Gwen, the sea goddess. Um, so this is off the coast of Shanghai, um, a very sacred site. Um, so the first permanent installation of this will open on the 1st of May, Visak, the Buddha's birthday, um, at the Foguan Shan Monastery in Taiwan. This um, is the world's largest Buddhist monastery and it receives 10 million visitors a year to its museum. The exhibition will then tour to major museums and countries of um, the world and the database continues to grow and will be a source for machine learning and human computer interaction into the future. So by way of brief conclusion, we could say that for the happy monk, Disinterested contemplation has been offset by effective participation and the authority to interpret objects has been redistributed. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for your wonderful journey, taking us to the world of augmented realities. The interactive and immersive experience what you have presented must be very uh, interesting to the all the participants i personally enjoyed it because i have been last 15 years in this journey i have been part of many sites which you have shown and as a member of international expert committee in digital dunohong i have been closely involved in that project so thank you very much for wonderful presentation